Hello guys, welcome back to episode number 28 of Carnival Muscle Ramblings, my live Q&A where it's usually myself, Sophie, and most recently Jerome Armstrong who has joined me today and he will be linked into the description box below if you want to follow his channel. How are you doing Jerome? Doing well Jonathan, how are you today? Good, thank you. I'm just pretending like we haven't been speaking for 10 minutes prior to this already. <laughs> That's true. Oh yeah. Yeah, this is um, an early one today, guys, because it's Maddie's birthday today. She turned one, which is very exciting. She's thrilled. Um, she's going to try and spend some time with her while she's still awake. And um, hopefully Sophie and I will be able to watch a film later, because all the lives I do, it's often the time of day when the girls are in bed and um, you know, things kick off in the States. But this time of day, it's more of a European kind of live, I guess. Fits in a bit better mm. for some, some folks. I understand the big Nevs in um, Poland or Belgium right now. He's probably about two hours ahead. So, yeah. It would be suitable for him to be able to listen in. Um, at least not do it at the sort of weird time of day that he probably usually is. So, and I'd just mm. like to um, have a shout out to Jenny or Jennifer. She's kind enough to donate, me, donate to me £10 through my YouTube donation link, which is on my website. If anyone wants to donate through that way, um, be much obliged to accept that money from you. And it'll probably land you with a bonus 500 composition coins. Excellent. To, um, <laughs> to help warrant you doing that. Um, that's a way of basically giving back to the channel in a way. Um, helps to fund my new laptop that I'm looking to buy. And yeah, just just helps me out a lot, basically. Uh, um, and it ensures that I don't lose 30% of the money that you do donate to me. So, oh yeah. All right, we get started some mm -hmm. questions, shall we? So Jerome was actually sent in two questions. I'll put them on the screen now. So Nayor asked, thoughts on Team 3D Alpha and Nucleus Overload? Is there any truth to it? Yeah, so I was actually watching this gentleman um, years ago, like, 2017 somewhere sometime around then and um, that's when i first started looking at youtube videos for like information and all these things come up like the quickest way to build muscle and everyone was looking at the new sort of things that would pop up in the um the in interweb so what i found was this is actually something that was developed um at least not in the kind of kind of frame that he's made it recently um probably around 30 years ago so on your top pro in the uk it's actually my stepdad's half brother's training principle which is called shock training and what it was was for a period of about three or four weeks you'd do an overreaching phase on a particular muscle group so if, for example you had weak calves you might be doing three four maybe five sets four calves and you'd be doing um quite close to failure training but you'd be doing that every single day for a period of about a month then after that, you'd give it a few weeks off. So this is actually created a long time ago. Um, and I think the the impetus was for Team 3D Alpha. Um, the guy was basically saying, you know, look at all these guys that have built huge muscles and they've had some sort of training or way of living which caused that muscle growth. So, for example, dead, uh, people that deadlift a lot would have huge traps. Um, so Johnny Jackson comes to mind, a bodybuilder. Another example might be um, someone that carries wheelbarrows all day that have huge traps as well. And people that might be builders will do some work, like lab labour work. They might be having I don't know, huge calf muscles because they're up and down ladders all day. You know, tiptoeing. They probably tiptoe more than anyone else on the planet ever <laughs> given 24-hour period. So that's kind of the theory behind it. And why do people have huge muscles, you know? Um, I think the same is true if you're someone that is an engineer. Maybe you have really strong grip or forearms if you're always using wrenches and spanners and things. That could be a reason why. So, yeah. Um, Jeremy, do you want to unpack this a little bit? So, perhaps yeah. outline what Nucleus Overload is. and what you Sure. Think. So, I've never heard of Team 3D Alpha. I really don't follow a lot of YouTube channels online, uh, barring present company. <laughs> um, so from what I read on their website, because I didn't want to misrepresent them, is it originally started when this gentleman read a study about how um, 
one, if you have like two synergistic muscles, like the gastrocnemius and the soleus in the calf or the biceps in the arm and the brachioradialis, if one of them becomes damaged um, and the other has to work significantly harder, um, it was speculated that satellite cells in the area would donate nuclei to those muscle cells to essentially cause uh, hyperplasia, the introduction of new muscle fibers. Um, so he essentially tried to recreate this type of protocol, thinking, how can I replicate this with training and do so in a way that simulates this but doesn't work them so hard that it allows for proper recovery? An actual nucleus overtraining protocol, or sorry, nucleus overload protocol, is um, you train a lacking body part or one to two body parts with five single sets every single day with 30 seconds rest between sets. And you take each set to about a nine on the scale from one to 10, as far as pushing yourself relatively hard. And you use relatively high repetitions. I think you said between 15 and 30 repetitions. Um, really, really short rest between sets, five sets, five sets every single day. And you do that every day for a month and then you deload. And he hypothesized that this will allow uh, satellite cells to donate nuclei to these muscle groups that you're trying to bring up. And then after you deload and go back to conventional training, you'll see sort of a super compensation in that particular muscle group. Um, to me, people have been trying to build bigger muscles for at least 50 years, dating back to the 1970s with Arthur Jones creating Nautilus exercise machines. Um, but the whole body culture and bodybuilding in a sense goes back to you know, even the late 1800s and even older, depending on, you know, when you want to start that. But I tend to think there's really new or sorry, really no deeply revolutionary way to build muscle. And if there was some way to do that, um, it stands to reason pretty much everybody would be doing this with the amount of money that happens in athletics and uh, the Olympics and some of the political ramifications of high level sports. Um, I imagine that if this was a really valid training protocol to maximize hyperplasia and the amount of muscle that people are capable of building in certain muscle groups, um, it stands to reason more people would do it. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't necessarily work. And I will be open to the possibility that somebody will discover a way to increase overload in muscles while not digging too deeply into recovery ability. But I... I don't think there's anything new under the sun. And from the studies I've seen, uh, hyperplasia as a concept is still relatively contested. Um, it's speculated that it does happen to some extent in humans, but the last couple of studies I've seen suggest it plays a very, very minimal role in building muscle compared to hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is making your muscle fibers bigger. Hyperplasia is the creation of new muscle fibers. Um, so, I'm open to the possibility that it may work, but I think for now we are inductively justified in being somewhat skeptical because this is such a niche thing and seeing as it's not widely used. Um, so I would just say train hard and train at a volume and frequency that you can recover from. And that's probably going to do most of the work for you. The only other thought I have is if somebody did experience a significant improvement in muscle size from nucleus overload training, I think it would probably be that even though they're training more frequently, whatever volume, frequency, and intensity they were using was possibly too much to what their body could recover from in the first place. And even if they're training every single day, even if they're going somewhat close to failure, um, it's possible that training with nucleus overload training represents less physical stress on the body than however they were training which would then allow for potential more uh, hypertrophy. Yeah. Yeah, brilliantly well said. Like you said, um, we are kind of appealing to authority here because we're, you know, some sort of new kind of training systems come across. And we're saying, you know, everyone else has done this for all this time, therefore that's what works. Um, the chances are like, you know, how many people have been doing bodybuilding now for say, say 50, 60, 70 years? You know, probably millions of people. Um, someone's would someone out there, or at least a group of people, would have tried all these things. Um, mm -hmm. If it was revolutionary, you know, they'd be on to it, and all the top pros out there, the bodybuilders, would be doing this. Um, the reality is, most bodybuilders are training 
you know, with a time and tension with uh, progressive overload to some extent. Now, some guys are genetic outliers. They can get away with seemingly nothing in terms of their workouts. Um, the, the sort of key underlying principle here is, you know, train hard, train safe, train, train effectively, and ultimately um, find some kind of progressive overload or progressive stimulus that you can adopt your training. And that's what's going to give you all the, the drive to build muscle. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of these things, well, they're kind of ways of overreaching, you know, if you're someone that's chronically been doing three sets of 10, you know, maybe 50% effort, you sort of don't go close to failure, then applying these sort of overreaching techniques might be useful because it gives you an idea, okay, you're training really hard, or at least, you know, nine out of 10 in terms of effort scale, um, to failure. You're doing that, you know, every day for three, four, five, six weeks straight. Then mm -hmm. you're giving yourself time to recover after that. Um, I think it will do something. It will, it will do something if you've been under training. Now, at the same point, um, you'd kind of have to prove causality in this sense. So, I know of myself, like I've got stronger from time to time. You know, make good progress in my lifts. Then it's not always kind of directly correlated with the the muscle growth that I've accrued over that time. It might be three months later, the muscle that I've gained as a result of that extra strength is then solidified. It's mm -hmm. almost like consol consolidated and compounded that effect. Um, so even to perform this kind of study, if you're going to get people to do it, it's going to be quite weak, quite limited. Um, the other thing I looked at was, I believe there are three studies this um, Team 3D Alpha YouTube channel looked at. So one was a rat study, which we know is weak in itself. One was basically saying my nuclei works, which probably does, which doesn't really say much about the training impetus itself. Um, I'm trying to think of the third one now. I think the third one was looking at blood flow restriction training and using yeah. repeated bout effects. So you're adding another variable to the the pot there. You know, it's not quite the way it's outlined in the program. So yeah, um, you know, it's a lot to unpack, a lot to look at. I think one yeah. of the benefits is that you're just getting more blood flow to the muscle, which might be something you need at that given time. Um, yep. So, yeah. And if you if you look at some of the suggested mechanisms, he recommends doing five sets with in a relatively brief amount of time to try and increase uh, some of the metabolic stress and the mechanical tension. Um, but if you're training with a sufficient degree of intensity and time under load, um, the lactic acid buildup, which was a, another suggested pathway he thought might cause some satellite cell activation, um, there are enough studies out there showing that lactic acid buildup just from conventional resistance training and performing multiple sets is enough to generate the metabolic stress, the mechanical tension, and the buildup of lactic acid that would cause satellite cell activation to begin with through conventional training. So it's not unique to nucleus overload training. And the other problem I, I have, so. and, and touching on what you said about strength gains is a part of any strength gain in any movement is just improved neuromuscular conditioning of that particular pathway. So um, a lot of people sometimes will realize that they're getting stronger in a particular movement, but like you said, it's not necessarily um, happening at the same time as hypertrophy, as muscles getting bigger. Well, you're just, in a lot of ways, you're continuing to become more efficient at that particular, or sorry, at that particular exercise. So you have to be even careful reading scientific studies, because if you're if you're looking at a study that does five sets of an exercise compared to one set of an exercise, and then they're saying the group that did five sets had significantly greater degrees of strength improvement, well, that would be expected because you're doing five times more practice on that one particular skill. The more objective way to track strength improvements would be to use a completely different type of movement using a different apparatus that involves those same muscles. Um, so could nucleus overtraining work? or nucleus overload training work? Possibly. Um, but I think you need to take any any suggested mechanisms of improvements in size and strength with a grain of salt. Brilliant. Yeah, I think um, the main piece we'll say here to people watching this, the main sort of takeaway is we are skeptical. Um, but give it a few more years, people might come out a whole you know mix of people and they might say, yeah, it's the best thing ever. Like pro bodies might start using it, so who knows? We'll we'll see them. We've got another question from Nail saying, "Why is too low 
time under load worse than higher time, time under load. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps it might be useful for us to outline what we think is a low time under load and what is a high time under load. Um, I mean, I'm just going to go to Wim here and say anything less than about 30 seconds is low time under load. What do you think? Yeah, I, I would probably call a low time under load under about 20 seconds or so. If I think of mm. how most people tend to lift, you know, a sort of explosive, maybe one second up and then two seconds down is kind of the cadence a lot of people use. A set of 10 would be 30 seconds. Um, mm. If you're doing lower repetitions, you know, most people that do bodybuilding usually don't go lower than eight. It would still be 24 seconds. So I think a normal, a normal time under load is probably 20 to 30 seconds. Um, I like using 60 to 90 seconds time under load. Um, and to provide a little context to this question, um, this came from a comment that he posted on my YouTube channel where he, he said, I, I understand why you're saying too high of a time under load may not stimulate fast twitch muscle fibers. Um, if your set goes too long, those slow twitch muscle fibers may be recovering before you can tap into the fast twitch muscle fibers. But then he was wondering what the downside was to having too short of a time under load. And to me, if your total time under load is less than, you know, 10 seconds for sure, but possibly even 20 seconds, it's not that that's less advantageous for building muscle. There are plenty of power lifters that have a, an above normal degree of muscle mass doing heavy doubles and triples and then leading up to singles during their competition. Um, they have a very, very low time under load for any individual set. The warning that I have with working really, really low time under loads, especially sub 10 seconds, is the amount of weight that you're going to have to use to approach momentary muscular failure within a very brief amount of time is, or at least can potentially be harder to control, which makes you more susceptible to injury. And it also, especially if you're lifting quickly, generates higher peak forces on your joints and is something that should be considered in the long term. So when it comes to looking at time under load, as long as you're under about two minutes, I think anything under about two minutes is probably about equally as effective for building muscle, but that doesn't mean that it's equally as effective in terms of safety and in terms of your ability to control the weight. Yeah, well said. I think you mentioned um, the longevity aspect of using very heavy weights and low time under load. So, you know, how are you going to progress if you have any have an injury because of the weight you're lifting? You know, it's going to be very tricky to do. Um, and I see a lot of people, just just anecdotally speaking, so putting silence aside here, um, if I see someone doing, say, bench press, say, doing 50 kilos, um, it's about 110 pounds, something like that, it'll be, like, usually the skinniest people in the gym, you know, very thin, um, usually groups of, like, three males, around about 16, 18 years old. They'll do um, a concentric phase, which might, might last about two seconds. Then eccentric phase will be, like, one second. So, for example, they're lifting the weight up, they're sort of grinding it out, then they're letting it drop on them. Um, yep. People will train like that. Um, and I think that's part of the problem with using um, too, time and, too low time under load as well. With high time under load as well, I think that, I mean, the metabolic fatigue buildup as you get higher and higher um, in terms of the time and detention itself, you know, if it's at least in about two minutes, it's about as hard as you want to go. And I think the same. I think that almost when you get to a, such a light weight, you can recuperate from the reps themselves yeah. almost um, continuously. You know, there'll be yeah. a point where you can't do it because you're, you know, you're, you won't, your grip won't go, your, your feet will hurt too much, something will happen. Yeah. But, um, I think that's kind of the problem there. And I think that your, your margin of error for doing that is quite, I mean, it's quite high. Um, if you spend five seconds resting between sets, you're doing 25, 30 repetition sets. You know, you're, you're recuperating as the set goes on. Um, so I think that's the problem, the caveat towards training with too uh, low, low, too high time under load. Um, yeah. Like Jerome said, I'd probably err on the side of 30 to 90 seconds. Um, you'll find a sort of an area which feels right for you. And I think that both can work and both do work. It's also under the context of what you can specifically do yourself. Um, mm -hmm. The problem with training for 30 second sets is that, well, at least in the lower range of what we're outlining here, is that you have to have very good muscle fiber activation. Uh, so think of like a pro bodybuilder, you go on YouTube now, type in Phil Heath training or something, his set will be about 30 seconds long. But his muscle fiber activation will be significantly higher than most people's. 
um, he is a he is a pro. You know, on the same under the same note, if someone's using hard time detention, it might be that they've got an injury, they don't want to strain extra secondary muscles that are activated during this sort of range of motion. For, for example, myself today, I was practicing some chest supported rows and I was probably aiming somewhere around 15 to 20 reps. I'm usually somewhere probably 12, 15 for that sort of movement. Um, but I find even with that sort of movement, with my spine injury, training with a heavier weight um, does still cause some potential damage, I think. So using a higher time and load for that sort of movement is better for me. So mm. there's there's a margin you can do. Um, and it's very tricky for us to sort of come out here and say, you know, 30 to 90 seconds. That's a broad, you know, 60 seconds between that. Um but it has to be a broad range. You know, there's no perfect way because if there was a perfect way, then, you know, Jerome's work wouldn't work. My work wouldn't work. Anyone doing anything in between wouldn't work. You know, there'd be a, a pinpointed, you know, 40 to 45 seconds is ideal or whatever happens to be. But we know that's not the case. So, yeah, yeah, very well said. Do you have anything to add to that, Jerome? Or... No, I, I think you absolutely nailed it with the positive side of being too long on, on with time under load, too. And, and I always use the analogy of something like cycling, walking, more conventional forms of so-called cardio are just really, really, really low intensity resistance training. You're 100% right. You could, If your intensity was low enough and the weight was long enough and the time under load was long enough, it's potentially um, you're just doing it one never-ending set. And those slower muscle fibers are just continuing to recover before that next contraction. You can continue to perform that set essentially indefinitely yeah all right might, we have, might have to award some composition coins i think yeah right. it's a big news um, first i think right i can't remember how many points i'm dis distributing at the moment is it 100 or Thou well i <laughs> i do a thousand, a thousand for first feels, place 500 for second place and 250 for third to try and provide some uh incentive for people to get here early i think people are starting to um Suss this out now, I think. <laughs> Even Lambs is in here early. It's good to see. All right. We'll just switch through the chat. Jerome, wish your luck. Hit them hard. Oh, yeah. Try. I've actually changed the Big Nivs um, program slightly. I've kind of uh, increased the frequency that he's hitting his body parts just because his overall training frequency has decreased a lot and he's trashed from his workout. So... You know, I kind of fit. I'm kind of varying the side of getting enough in in a given time period. But um, you know, he's training intuitively now. He's, you know, really nailing it. He's, he's understanding training so much better. You know, week on awesome. week, I'm sort of getting better feedback from him. Like um, you know, his soreness. He's understanding things. Just, it's amazing to see. You know, because these sort of things take years to learn. Oftentimes, so yeah. he's definitely expediting his understanding and um, it's probably his results as well. We'll see soon in his logbook. Awesome. And that's, that's the power of coaching, right? Is you not just have that accountability, but he gets to benefit from year to years of experience and working with other people and trial and error. And, and think of how much time this has probably saved him over the long run and how his routine now is so tailored to what he's doing. But you, you may have saved him months or years of frustration and angst and figuring out like, what the hell can I do to, and am I at my genetic limit? And sometimes you just a slight manipulation in volume and frequency and all of a sudden you start gaining strength really rapidly again. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He might be doing, um, I don't know if he went online to like Google how to get bigger legs, he'd come across, I don't know, the German volume training article, uh, 10 sets of 10 on squats. You might, you know, I, I know he's got, um, bad knees sometimes that could really wreck his joints. You know, yeah. if he just does 10 by 10, you know, the way they outline without the specifics of training properly, about the understanding of cadence, about the understanding of exercise um, execution, that could put him back backwards. You know, that could seriously injure him. You know, that's the yeah. problem with looking online for these sort of um, these answers. It's mm. not the best answers aren't often found in articles. I don't think. Nor could they be. Everyone's body is unique enough to where the same fundamental principles will apply to everybody, but the implementation of that into a theory that best fits your genetics, your diet, and your lifestyle is something that has to be experimented with to some extent and then finely tuned. Mm. So, yeah, it would be easy for Jonathan and I to sell workout templates and just prescribe rigid routines to people for 50 bucks on Instagram. And we could probably make some decent coin that way, but it's, it's disingenuous in a certain sense. 
Yeah, we're gonna release um an ebook between us at some point, like a a short kind of outline, but you know, enough that the average person could look it up, pick you know, pick up, look at it and think, Okay, I kinda know where I'm heading now. Um yeah. and even that, although it will be correct in the sense that you know, it works. It won't be specific because it can't be specific. You know, everyone's got an individual way that they can do things and perform exercises. Um, you know, so that's where the consultations come in. That's where getting a coach comes in, yep. all that sort of thing. So you can approach Jerome or myself to get more understanding of what you're trying to achieve and how you're going to do it. Um, we've got a question from Zbigniew as well regarding time and load. Number of fibers engaged. Does time and load include rest pause? That's a good question. Um, might tackle the first bit first, so number of fibers engaged. I believe it will never be all of them, because if, for example, the last muscle fiber is engaged and it burns itself out effectively, you know, it fatigues, what are you going to do then? If you're doing an overhead press, the the shoulder, the, um, the bar will squash you. So it'll never be 100%. Um, now we know even when we're still in bed, you know, Muscle fibers have to be engaged at some point because they're keeping you stable. You know, they're not. I would just go limp, wouldn't you? Your body would just um, cease to exist in, in a way. Um, so I'd probably. I've seen different numbers for this personally. I'd say somewhere between like maybe 65 and 80 percent of all muscle fibers can be engaged. Um, the level of advancement in someone's training might dictate that as well. So, for example, Eddie Hall would be able to activate all his muscle fibers to lift a big ass weight. Um, me probably a bit less um, than someone like maybe a complete beginner to the gym, even less than that. Um, I think that we do we do as human beings have a potential to protect, protect ourselves under severe stress and um, complications. For example, if it was Maddie's first birthday today, if for example there was a car and it's heading towards Maddie, um, even at the risk of injuring myself. Um, I would have to find a way to stop that car. Even if I, I, I have to sort of grab Maddie and sort of push the car away, that'd be my natural instinct. Uh, I'm not going to do anything with the car, but all my <laughs> muscle fibers would be engaged on stopping that car from moving anywhere, you know? Um, so that's kind of where it comes to play. And the, the, the car would squash me, but that's an instance where all your muscle fibers will be engaged. But that's very rare. You know, it's a life or death kind of situation which your body doesn't really doesn't doesn't really naturally um attend to you know your body doesn't never goes through that sort of extreme stress to really activate that many muscle fibers um do you think the same during war you got different numbers at all or i if i had to guess i would suspect that the amount of muscle fibers that we can volitionally uh recruit is probably i would think at best maybe a third um just because you could you could kind of ballpark in those life and death scenarios the amount of weight sometimes that people actually do lift you know, you're, you're talking housewives that are able to lift up the back of a car and scoot it over a couple of feet. Um, and that might be equivalent to a, a partial range of movement deadlift with a 120 pound housewife doing you know, the equivalent of like a eight, 900 pound deadlift. Um, I don't know, we could look at it, but I, I suspect that that number is, is probably under 50%. But it, the actual absolute amounts in those life and death situations, I guess, is I guess that proportion doesn't even matter. I would like to believe that we could whip ourselves into such a, a focused, concentrated state to where whatever that number is that we're volitionally capable of recruiting to where we could just gradually increase that just a slight bit over time. I think there's probably an evolutionary factor as well as we become more sheltered, more protected, food's more accessible. Um, we'd less like to be in these endangered situations. So where it might have been, perhaps maybe, I don't know how far to, but say 50,000 years ago, when we're, we're true hunters in a sense, we might have been able to activate a lot more muscle, muscle fibers. Um, maybe our muscle fibers now, like the, the variations between them would be broader. So we'd have slow twitch right here um, and fast twitch would be right here. But now it might be bit narrower because we don't have that impetus for the um the very fast twitch muscle fibers you know and i would think that's that's probably like you said an evolutionary protective mechanism because the ability to maximally recruit 100 percent in a life and death situation will help to protect ourselves in that situation or those in our tribe but it often comes with 
acute or chronic uh, repercussions, right? We will we'll lift that car, but then we'll end up having fractured a couple of our vertebrae or torn our biceps, you know, right off of our radius. Um, so yeah, I, sorry. And there's still uh, two more parts to that question. I suppose we've gone on a bit of a tangent. I kind of want to hear your answer to uh, the other two. Oh yeah. So yeah. So the second part of the question is, does time to load include rest pause? That's a really good question because we are, most of us people that are bodybuilding are purists. We like numbers. We like to know, okay, over this set, I did two minutes of time and tension or where it happens to be. Um, strictly speaking, logically speaking, it, it does, it's not included. So the rest period itself wouldn't be included. Um, I think, I mean, Jerome had a very good answer to this, or this sort of topic on his channel. Uh, if you go to Jerome Armstrong's YouTube channel, type in rest pause, something like that, it will come up very good video and why he doesn't like it which i thought was quite quite interesting because rest pause is something i like using um it does have its pros and cons though so in terms of this question i'd say the time under load for a given set would include the actual secondary third fourth you know execution of the exercise um, just to outline rest pause it's typically from my understanding um say you can do 10 repetitions with a on a bench press. Let's not use a bench press, let's use a, a barbell curl. So a barbell curl, then you might rest for five to 10 seconds. Um, some people have higher rest periods, but I think after that point, it kind of becomes an area where you're actually doing a second set and a third set. I think that it's still, to, to, to sort of outline it as being under the same set, you'd have to have it within 5, 10, maybe 15 seconds. I think 30 seconds is too long. And it con constitutes a second set, basically. Um, you know, you're you're resting more, in, in a sense. Um, so, like I said, going to ramble here, carnival ramblings. Say so 10 rep set, uh, maybe 10 second rest. You might then do, from experience, maybe 3 reps. Rest 10 seconds again, maybe 2 reps, 2 reps again, 2 reps again. And the last one would probably be one rep. Um, I think that that would all count, count under time detention with the exception of the 10 second rests. So there's a way of doing it in a short time frame in terms of getting muscle fiber activation, metabolic byproduct, um, accumulation, fatigue. It's a way of doing it. I think it's probably the way I train. If I had, say, 10 minutes, three times per week to train, I wanted to do a push pull leg split. Yeah, I'd probably do some sort of rest pause technique. I think that'd be useful for me. Um, at least the way I train. And when I'm changing exercise, I, like, I do like to rest between exercises. I know Jerome's a bit different. Um, Jerome's a lot fitter than I am, though, so that's part of the reason why. What do you think about time to load and rest pause? Yeah, touching on the, the first part of the question, I would say that time under load does not necessarily uh, equivocate to the number of fibers engaged. And the reason being, you could have a much longer time under load with a significantly lighter weight versus a heavier weight. Um, I think whether someone is using time under load or whether someone is uh, using a certain repetition range, um, let me think, I wanna be kind of precise with my words. Your goal is to safely reach momentary muscular failure within either a certain time under load range or within a certain desired repetition count. You're not just arbitrarily trying to perform some um, number of reps. You're not trying to hit some exact second counts. Your goal is always safely hitting failure. And then the way that you measure that is either through repetitions or time under load. So time under load in and of itself isn't equal to the number of fibers that you engage. Um, time under load similarly then is also not equivalent to workout volume because some people say that workout volume is your time under load. Well, obviously, if you have 10 pounds in your curling, you'll have a much higher time under load compared to curling 40 pounds. Um, the way that, and it's funny, I'll have to go back and watch that video on rest pause. I don't do it in my training, but I will implement rest pause sometimes with clients that I have. Um, I prefer drop sets, um, but sometimes I use time under load and I think both can be effective. Um, the way that I implement things like rest pause into time under load is I generally like to have all of my clients hit concentric failure or technical failure that 
which is just what I call when form starts breaking down within 60 to 90 seconds of the set begin beginning. And if they hit that number either a little bit less than 60 or anywhere less than 90, normally then I'll do rest pause or excuse me, either rest pause or partial repetitions or heavy negatives or some kind of set intensifier to try and get that set up to about 90 seconds. And not that I'm expecting them to get significantly greater degrees of size and strength increases from those set intensifiers. The idea is to just teach them mentally that they have more effort that they're capable of exerting. So on my plate loaded leverage shoulder press machine, uh, my client last night is active military. He did uh, multiple years in the army. Now he's in the national guard and he comes in. So I know I can push him really hard. So he hit a positive failure on his shoulder press just under one minute. Um, I helped him do one or two assisted repetitions that got him up to about 75 seconds time under load. And then I just said, okay, I'd like this set to go on a little bit longer because there's a slight cardiovascular benefit to just pushing hard. So we're going to do some uh, rest pause. And I just looked at the stopwatch. We counted out 10 seconds, and then he did one or two more repetitions, however much he could. And we just did two or three rest pause repetitions like that. So the way that I would track that is however the amount of time was or however many repetitions it took him to get to concentric failure, I make note of that on his progress chart. And then I'll just write RP or rest pause up to 90 seconds or rest pause, you know, three reps, however many he did. And that's whether we do um, rest pause, that'll be whether we do forced repetitions, that'll be whether we do just negatives. Sometimes I'll use, um, I don't think the actual set intensifier matters that much. They're just tools to try and teach your client that they're capable of exerting more effort and reaching a higher degree of intensity. So um, as long as you're objective with how you track it, um, it doesn't matter too much if you include a lot of that rest pause time into your total time under load or not. Perfect. I think I found something we disagree on. Rest pause? No, no just, um, you prefer uh, drop sets over rest pause. I understand your rationale for it because I understand that um, your muscles know tension. They don't know the weight, so to speak. Your muscle knows that was hard, that wasn't hard. So yeah, and it makes complete sense in that sense. Um, I think it's more contextual to my kind of position in training. So I already track my workouts quite specifically. I'll put, you know, eight and a half reps. I'll put, uh, you know, I'll use uh, some descriptive words to describe a set sometimes, which is quite um, offensive to some people. But, you know, I'll just basically say crap set or you know, this made my joints feel sore, you know, I'll put something like that after. So it's important if you're doing a drop set, like Jerome rightly said, you know, make sure you're putting, you know, drop set to 25 kilos from 30 kilos with, um, you know, same standardized form or, you know, keep it all the same if you can and be very specific. I think with my logging, I'm, I'm not a fan of logging it in that kind of way because I think it can overcomplicate things. Yep. Um, I think sometimes as well, I train on my own, I guess my my experience is different because I do train on my own most of the time. So if Jerome's training someone, he can give them the weights. He can lower the weight. He can change the weight on the stack. It makes it a lot easier, you know? Whereas me, if I'm yeah. training my own, if I'm going from one weight to the next, I'd rather just use the same weight, you know? Yeah. I, I laugh a bit because that's exactly the point that I was going to make is if I'm using selectorized weight stack machine, I prefer to just do a drop set. If I was doing squats or a bench press or a lot of free weight movements and I didn't really have the ability to strip those tiny plates off the outside of the bar, I would use rest pause. Um, the idea of doing those intensifiers is, I mean, what we're really trying to do with those is, yeah, we want to show ourselves that we have more effort, but with like guys like me and you that are a little bit more experienced, we're trying to tap into those more fast twitch muscle fibers. And with rest pause, um, that time that you're resting, whether it's three seconds, five seconds, I don't go any longer than 10 seconds. Some of those more intermediate and slower twitch fibers are recovering so that when you perform your rest pause repetition or two reps or three reps or however many you get out, you're, you've recovered just a slight bit that you're able to recruit those fibers again, and then hopefully dig a little bit deeper into those more fast twitch fibers. Um, so depending on the equipment that I have and what I was using, there are absolutely lifts that I would use rest pause instead of trying to do something else. Um, I'm not 
against it in and of itself, but given that I do almost everything I have on selectorized weight stack equipment, um, I just prefer to keep that set going and drop the weight a little bit. But yeah, if I was doing squats, if I had something I didn't want to strip plates off of, um, and I just wanted to hold a barbell or keep a barbell on my back and do squats, um, I would do rest pause. I see. So you don't really disagree then. That's disappointing. No, not, not when you started, not when you started going down that road, I'm like, I'm like, I feel exactly the same way. <laughs> so. mm. Yeah. Well said. Perfectly. Perfectly well said. Um, disappointing. We, we still have to agree on things. So come on. we'll find something eventually for a leave. I'm sure. I, I mean, look, really that the, the only thing I know that we slightly disagree on is I'm a, I'm a bigger proponent of very slow concentrics. Um, I know you go anywhere from one to three seconds on the way up on most of your lifts. I, I try and lift as slowly as possible. I, I really don't think there's a big difference in terms of hypertrophy. Um, and I track time under load and you tend to track more repetitions. But if I was lifting quickly, I would track repetitions in t instead of time under load anyways. So, yeah, we're in agreement with a lot of things. Interesting. Yeah, I think I think as long as you're tracking something and you're standardizing whatever you are doing. Yeah. It kind of works, doesn't it? Um because if I, I, will, it, I will happily try out the concentric, so I will try the slow. Cause it's all good me saying, you know, I mean, I've I've done the super slow negatives before, but I've never tried it with concentrics. At least, I mean, I don't know if I'd want to do a ten second concentric, but I could see myself yeah. doing three or four seconds, you know. And I and I don't think there's a difference between three or four seconds versus ten seconds one way. I just generally advocate that people go as slow as possible in each direction to where it's not a series of starts and stops because that encourages greater control over the weights. Um, but if if you're going slower, I wouldn't count repetitions because if you're doing four seconds up, four seconds down, you might get a certain number of repetitions. But if you're not keeping too ah. close of a track of a set cadence. If all of a sudden, if you're going five seconds up, five seconds down, it might feel the same as you're moving the weight, but all of a sudden you're like, shit, I got two fewer repetitions. Like I'm getting weaker. Um, so if I was lifting quickly and lowering slowly, I would track repetitions. If I was lifting relatively slowly, I would track time under load. That's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. I guess it's a more accurate metric because you might do say six repetitions and I might do 10. Yeah, but if your six repetitions take ninety seconds, my ten take, I don't know, um, ninety seconds. Yeah, you're going to get a closer margin of, well, a smaller margin of error if you're counting the time under load because each repetition itself will take longer to perform. Yeah, brilliant. But but if, yeah, if I was lifting like Dorian, uh, really explosive lift, and then you know as he talks about like a spring coiling on the negative, really controlling that negative, I would count repetitions, and I would have a repetition goal eight to ten probably just and then the second i can get 11 on my own i'd increase the weight by the smallest amount and i would keep tracking reps so. oh, cool that's great um good evening fellow cooked carnival cultists yeah we're all brainwashed into cooking our meats i've done it wrong i'm doing it wrong <laughs> <laughs> oh never mind it's where it comes up in every live now. Um, Susie Underwood has said, happy birthday to Maddie. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, she's getting big. She's uh, 11 kilos currently of muscle. Lean muscle. She's got the um, linear alba showing in her abdomen. She's ripped. She's developing some lower traps as well at the moment from all her pulling movements. I do like that. I do like the carnivore kids workout video that you have a few months ago on your channel. That, that brought me a lot well, of the joy. most unliked video on my channel. Yeah, that, that, that was one of my favorites. Yeah, I like one. That's one of my favorites to make actually. I, I enjoyed that one a lot. It's nice to just film stuff rather than be in front of a camera worrying what to do. You know, it's quite sweet. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark said, bringing back geezers and muscle vests. I like it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, Sophie, you all right? Sophie's currently about 10 feet underneath me right now. There we go. I'm on the, sec I'm on the second floor. Uh, she's not under the ground, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I'm glad you Just clarified to clarify. that. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. Isn't, uh, <laughs> this isn't the telltale heart. <laughs> Jerome has kindly donated. don't know how you've done that, Jerome. I opened another window quick, so I was probably... Oh, that's kind looking... of you, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. 
Yeah, I'll give, um, I'll give Maddie that much. So Maddie, I think, has a savings fund. I was thinking of putting some money in each year, then when she's old enough to actually pick like a present, um, she can actually pick something. Because right now, like, Sophie's bought her stuff, and I could just give her stuff. But it's not that... You know, like, everyone in the family will give her, like, a soft toy, some musical instrument thing, some bricks, some clothes. I'd rather just put the money together and save it to a point where she can choose something herself when she's, like... You know, four or five years old, she can go to the toy shop and think, I've got all this money, I can pick what I want. I think she'd um, yeah. she'd appreciate that more. Rather than just getting her, like, run-of-the-mill stuff everyone else does, you know. Yep. Um, anyway, thank you, Jerome. Sophie and I You're appreciate welcome. that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it happened again. After yesterday's training, I almost dosed, dosed off at work. Today I feel good, but set soreness is huge. Thanks so much, besides my high level of energy and humor present. Humor is underrated, I think. <laughs> makes makes my day honestly yeah i like his comments on your videos recently as well I, he he's always so positive and mm. there are moments that I, I really appreciate that and he commented on a video of mine from like two years ago and i'm thinking man he's he's going into the deep cuts i don't even remember what i said on this video so i, I yeah, probably you're a little kid yeah i need to go back and audit <laughs> some of my old youtube videos um but i always appreciate his positivity and he just seems like the kind of guy that just works hard and always has a great attitude and, and what's not to love about that yeah i can see he works hard guys yeah um, definitely in a lot of his lifts he works much harder than me honestly i'm looking at his leg press sometimes i'm seeing him, like shaking like and his face is like yeah. yeah that's awesome it's crazy and he, he has like I've, I've spoken to him a couple times before he is a very very positive person he's a great listener as well which always helps in a coaching client kind of situation you know yeah, very good. Uh, thoughts about MCT oil? Funny enough, I think about half the people I speak to get the runs from it. Mm. Is in number two doesn't go too well. It all goes too much, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, so it's a big enough. My, um, I, I used some MCT powder before in oils and different things like that. And I had the runs every single time. My brother also had the runs every single time. So... It's it's a fuel source if you can use it. I think it's one of those hit and miss kind of things. I think just because it's not really, I don't know how to explain it. I feel like it's not something we're built to do, deal with. You know, I can't imagine MCT oil being out there in the wild for the last three hundred fifty thousand years. You know, I just don't see it happening. So I think it's a modern food. Um, I think that people can have issues with it in a lot of cases. What about you, Jerome? Have you tried that sort of thing? Um. I've tried it in the past. I don't recall ever having any digestive issues, but I didn't really notice any benefit either. But I was just adding a, a tiny little bit in my coffee in the morning. Um, maybe it's just me being cheap, but it's expensive. <laughs> so um, I, I tend to think I, I'd rather just have a, a pat of butter or um, a scoop of beef tallow, or I still got to make some of these butter bites that you rave about at some point. Um I don't know, maybe. Maybe some people see some benefit to it, but short of having it maybe on an empty stomach early in the morning when you feel like you need a little bit of a hit of energy, um, I don't know how much use there would really be from a practical standpoint. I guess um, try it and find out, see if your stomach tolerates it. I know for Susie, <laughs> she seems to be fine with it, so hmm. there we go. Try it. I, I mean, what I'd suggest to people is if you want to use these sort of things... Um, Use them sparingly. Use a small, very small amount. Try and find a way of like sampling it off your mate if if a friend has one, rather than buying a bottle. It is expensive stuff, so yeah. You know, um, I I probably say as well. It's probably there's probably better fats out there. I know it's going to be void of uh, fats or vitamins. So I don't think that's going to be advantageous. At least if you're like Jerome myself, you can tolerate butter and things like that. That's going to be better for you. I think um, if you can't do that, tallow's just as good if not better in some cases um just deal with what you can tolerate i think um yeah apologies rick sorry um i know rick and kyle have had issues accessing this one yeah so i put a post out early today maybe i want to say three or four hours ago so it was quite late notice to be fair um the reason being is it's maddie's birthday today and Sophie and I are conscious of spending some time together in the evening and also celebrating a bit with Maddie. 
Um, she's one today, for you guys that don't know. And yeah, it's just the odd one, but um, usually I keep this at 7 p.m. UK time. It seems to work quite well for me. Um, and yeah, Jerome's been fortunate enough or, well, I say fortunate or unfortunately, he's not had a client at this particular time of day. So <laughs> he's able to join me today and um, answer some really good questions. So we mm. actually went into a lot of depth today, didn't we? What do you think? Yeah, I think so. It's been good so far. Yeah. What should we do now? Then just have a chat, unless there's any more questions. We yeah, talk about our day and our training so far, and what our goals are, and what's going on. I just look at Rick's comment. And it makes me think that you guys need to be scheduling your day around these videos that Jonathan and I put out. I don't care about team lunch meetings. I don't care about whatever you have going on in your lives. Like this is the standard of how you guys need to be scheduling your day, and this needs to be top priority. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I won't add much to that. I think it's um, very well said. I'll say just a quick update for me is um, the other day I did a workout with my brother. So we did basically a chest and shoulder workout. My brother usually trains, he trains basically a bro splits, but he still do body part splits basically. So might be chest arms or chest biceps, back triceps or back biceps, uh, legs, and we'll do a shoulder day, something like that. So we'll train four times a week like I usually do. Um, so he was kind enough to join me in my session and... I think I picked the first three or four exercises and I let him pick the last one just because I thought, you know, I'm using his home gym that he's paid thousands of pounds for. Um, you know, we've organized it together. So I thought, you know, I let him choose the last exercise because I'm quite particular with my exercises because there's something I can and can't do because of my injury and because of my, I don't know what the word is, maybe like over analytical nature of the way I train and where I look at my, th my kind of um, outline, my programming. Basically what happened was I did my usual workout um, close to what I usually do as possible. I was doing a wide push up directly into a underhand moderate, you know, under, under neutral grip push up. Neutral grip? Neutral range, you yeah. know, shoulder width sort of grip. Yeah. Um, then we did a close grip one. What happened was I've actually s quite badly sprained my wrist around here. So all the muscles around here are quite inflamed and sore. You might not be able to tell, you probably can't tell that much, but um, it's very sore. It's horrendously sore. Um, and I just had a nap, I think, yesterday, and I woke up and I was like, ooh, and it felt really swollen. So now I don't think I'll be able to do push for a little while. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it's, my own, it's my own fault for doing something that I wouldn't usually, usually do. But yeah, we did a, basically a tri-set, so it was um, probably very different to what I'd usually do. Yeah. Um, I agree. Fuck the work stuff. Low. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I'm glad you made it anyway. I'm glad um you know, if you've made it late to this today, I say, I say late, you've made it at a time that wasn't helpful, then just go back to the start and you can watch it all again. And again, and put it on a playlist and send it to your friends and share it and stuff. Um I'll probably make a few clips out of this video, by the way. Um probably about three clips. I think hmm. some of the answers we get went into are very detailed and talked around the topic a lot, so pretty help people out. Um I mean, it's not the way that I'm looking to do my channel long term, but I think for now, at least until we're able to train outside, do some recordings, spend more time actually doing different videos and different topics, and it's a way of having a catalogue of information that people can access, and people ask me questions, I can say, I can ref refer them to, okay, look at my channel, type in rest pause, time to load, or whatever it is, then you can find a video there, Yeah. Um, see what I've got to say. If that doesn't answer questions, then, you know, ask another question, I can answer it again in a different way. So yeah, I take lunch from 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern time so I get the opportunity to see your videos. Today I am eating lunch and trying to put the fuel tank back in my truck. Nice. Is Hopefully that your you're... time, Drew? No, I'm in Central, so Rick is one hour ahead of me. Okay. Hopefully there's no fuel in the tank when you're trying to put it back in the truck. That can get heavy fast. <laughs> yeah, I imagine you've got a huge truck as well. <laughs> Hmm. Wish there was a way to share my heart rate one today to you guys from my rowing jump rope hit session. Kind of cool to see all the ups and downs of my heart rate. Yeah, my brother actually um, has been doing some kind of similar training to you in a way, Kyle. So he's been doing, uh, I want to say two or three intervals per week. I want to say two or three, I don't know. 
but his fitness has gone up drastically fast. Um, insane, but the same applies to me. If I do any kind of cardio in any sense, it's my resting heart rate goes down, everything just drops. Um, yeah. I feel a lot fitter, but I can't really do anything right now. I couldn't do a row. Um, I couldn't do cycling because the, the impact on my hips and the, my sacrum is quite, it doesn't feel right. Uh, I've done cycling and I can't cycle, I can cycle to and from the gym, but it doesn't feel quite right. And it does leave my hips quite sore. Um, imagine the same is true for walking up a hill, same is true for elliptical trainer, cross trainer. So anything which is, any, any even any of the low impact stuff is high impact for me at the moment. So I can't really focus on my fitness right now, which is, uh, I'd say devastating, but I'm more focused on hypertrophies. Um, well, and and fitness is one of those things. Um, it's a goofy word because fitness can be highly general, right? It's mm. it's fitness in one sense is your ability to adequately perform at any physical task, um, but fitness is also highly specific. The more you do one particular skill, you get very very good at that one particular skill. So I never jog i never do any kind of running ever um but usually once a year i'll test my one mile time and it's usually right around the low low six minutes you know six minutes five seconds six minutes ten seconds um and that's right around 220 pounds um but i'm gassed after that but what i've noticed like since i got a dog is sometimes i'll just kind of chase him around the first couple of times I, I ran after my dog i was like holy shit i'm really getting gassed out quickly but then just two or three days later um, after running a little bit, like I, I could run and it wasn't really, it wasn't taxing me at all. And I'd suspect that if I, if I reconditioned some of those neuromuscular pathways, I, and instead of just running one mile once a year or so, if I led up to that with a couple of weeks of actual jogging and then tested my one mile time, I think I could probably get that into the low fives. Um, but same kind of thing. So fitness is a really goofy word in that way. I know that you say that, I'm more fit than you, but I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Um, go back and watch uh, Drew Bay interviewed Doug McGuff, the guy that wrote Body by Science. And Drew used to advocate going as quick from exercise to exercise as possible to try and maximize the cardiovascular benefit. And it was later pointed out by Doug McGuff that as long as you have a buildup of lactic acid or pyruvate, it'll get metabolized eventually and you will see the benefits in the aerobic part of your metabolism from this. So you don't have to rush from exercise to exercise as fast as you can. As long as you're pushing those sets hard enough, if you take 30 or 60 seconds between a set, you're going to basically get the same cardiovascular benefit as going from set to set to set to set. And since then, Drew has been towing closer to that line. Um, but I, I tend to think, you know, if, if your body would allow, if your back and your hips would allow, and you practiced one particular skill, you would get very, very good at that very quickly because you have such a profound general degree of fitness. Um, for those people who are old enough to remember the wide world of sports that used to be on ABC back in the 70s and 80s, they would take celebrities, they would take athletes, they would take bodybuilders even, and they would put them through a wide array of different physical activities. And the bodybuilders did really, really well, despite most of their activity being just weightlifting. Um, they'd put them in like swimming or climbing or running, and they did far better than a lot of people would expect because they have a very broad degree of fitness. So I know I've gone down a bit of a, a rabbit hole here, but I, I suspect, Jonathan, if you were to, and if you had the capability to row, to cycle, to run, uh, I think you would surprise yourself after just a few sessions with how good you would probably be at some of those activities interesting yeah i'd i'd have to look at my programming so when fitness does become more of a priority i can actually look at my program and say okay on these sort of movements so for example i wouldn't be able to progress quickly from set to set doing a back movement or a leg movement i could do it on a push movement or maybe some leg movement like a calf raise for example you know there's going to be some sort of areas where i can do that um probably have to recalibrate my training a little bit. It'd be quite a mix max of um, body parts, but yeah, I think it's d definitely possible. Mm. Got one last question from Rick. Have any of you noticed body hair increasing on the carnival diet? A friend of mine close to my age has gone carnival, but was complaining that his arm and leg hair has increased. I've always been hairy, Rick. Um, <laughs> I've actually had my back lasered for about five or six times. It's 
horrendous sometimes. Um, yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite fortunate that Sophie's shaves me a lot of the time, uh, probably every month or so. So I've been quite lucky in that regard. But yeah, it's um, I couldn't honestly give a, an opinion on that because I've always been hairy. What about you, Jerome? Do you notice any difference? It's hard to tell how much of that might just be getting a little bit older. I know Sean Baker, Anthony Chafee, and um, even earlier, um, what's his name? Paul Saladino, I've talked about how they've had clients that have been able to increase their testosterone by eating more animal fat and more cholesterol. And with more testosterone, I guess, comes the possibility of having more body hair. Um, and thinking about it now, how what the average 20-year-old nowadays has the same testosterone levels as a 60-something-year-old man had back in the year 2000, I, that's got to be diet and lifestyle related. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if people eating a more species appropriate diet had the testosterone levels that they were supposed to have. Um, and there were some associated physiologic changes with that. Um, for me, I didn't notice anything specifically from going carnivore, but, um, I also noticed as I hit my close to my mid thirties, I started getting some relatively long, dark hairs on my back. Um, so I try and shave those bad boys, but I, I think some of that is just getting older. Yeah, maybe. I'm gonna test my test. I'm gonna test my testosterone levels in probably the middle of June this year. So in about two months from now, I think. Um, and I'm gonna shock you guys with how high those levels are. And that will also be without putting in exogenous testosterone, which I have not used since September, October ish time, two thousand and twenty one. Hmm. Um, so I've not injected testosterone since that time. Um, even at that point, it was a pre-competition phase, and that was not a lot. It was above TRT levels, but it wasn't a lot, a lot, you know? Yeah. But yeah. Um, and even if you tested it and it wasn't that high, and I'm reminded that Sean Baker's blood work showed relatively low levels. He was still yeah. within the normal range, but and I think the way that he described it is like, imagine testosterone is a key that's floating around in your bloodstream and androgen receptors throughout the body are like locks on all the cells in your body. And um, if you have a lot of locks, you can maximize the amount of keys that you're having, even if you don't necessarily have a lot of keys. But if you don't have a lot of locks, it doesn't matter if your testosterone is really, really high if you can't utilize all of it. Um, so it's one of those things that the range is so broad for males, something like the the range for testosterone in the average 40 year old male, which is where I think the refer reference range comes from, is like two or 300 nanograms per deciliter all the way up to like 11 or 1200. So you can be within the normal range and have almost four times more testosterone in your blood at that moment compared to the guy standing right next to you. Um, that's a really, really broad range for something that is still described as normal. Mm. So I'd, I'd be curious where your numbers are at, but ultimately, I mean, you're, you obviously still have a much larger degree of muscle mass than the average individual. Um, libido doesn't appear to be an issue, uh, at least from talking to you. So um, whatever it is, I think is, is probably great for you right now. It doesn't appear to be deficient in any, in any way at all. Yeah, I think, um, well, I'll say the last time I had it tested, it was 1,500. And that was absent of any hormones in my body for four months. <laughs> this man has testicles. God, like, like, he has yeah. testes like avocados. <laughs> I wish. They're more like um, pebbles. <laughs> Fruity pebbles. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, um, guys, if people are watching this after the point or watching it now, um, please don't ask me any questions on this. Um, when it comes to like hormones and what sort of thing if you want to know anything speak to an endocrinologist don't speak to me about it i'm not your doctor i can give you my ideas about what i've done in the past and what did and didn't work but outside of that that's a consultation question um so yeah please don't send me dms and you know don't ask me because i won't answer you um but yeah 1500 was the range that i got which will hmm. make people think um i'll tell jerome off air what what happened but yeah, that was absent of any drugs and stuff, but yeah. Yeah, people don't believe me, I can tell, because I wouldn't believe me either. Well, and I just, I, I understand that, but I, I think people also need to realize that there are 
there's a wide array of genetic expression with any trait from just look at height. There's some people that are, you know, under three feet tall and there are people that are almost eight feet tall and that's just one trait. And there are a number of traits that contribute towards, you know, building a muscular physique. Uh, there's probably dozens of traits that all factor into that and testosterone is just one. Mm -hmm. Um, so not only is the normal range huge, but there are outliers to any single genetic trait anyways. So, um, yeah, I don't know if, if people think, if people think you're juicy or if people don't believe you, like that's a great compliment. That's a really great compliment. Yeah. I definitely wouldn't believe me. Um, I went on to Sean Baker's podcast, like whenever that was a few months ago. And I was like, yeah, Sean Baker, I think you are actually natural from a guy that is a bodybuilder that can talk about who is and isn't using things. I think Sean, you are natural. And, um, I'll find out through, I'll find out through Dr. Chaff Chaffee at some point as well. Hmm. I think if he did tell me, I wouldn't. If he disclosed that information to me, I probably wouldn't tell anyone anyway because it would be personal, you know. I just wouldn't bring it up in conversation. Well, it's funny because even if he wasn't, like, who really cares? <laughs> like, what, yeah. what difference what'd you do with it? What do you do with that information if you right. did or didn't know? Mm. Yeah, completely. Um, just go for the chat, then we're going to disappear off in a minute because I'm sure Jerome's bursting for a toilet. <laughs> You know, you just, you got to sneak that in every live video, don't every, you? Every single one. <laughs> That's fine. You take yeah, your get... fruity pebbles and you, you, you get off of my secondary channel. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I've got hairs like along here and everything. My, head, my back's even worse. Every part of me is very, it's ridiculous. I'm much hairier than my brother though, which is weird. Um, hmm. That's cool. like duck eggs. I wish. Actually, I probably don't wish. You heard what Rich Piana said about that sort of thing? No. This is quite a crude talk, so I hope there's no women watching this. But um, basically said, <laughs> do, does your does your dick hang lower than your balls? Yeah. Hmm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be funny to listen to back later. Um, I know I'm not a hairy guy, just a few chest hairs, so I figured out to just pluck them instead of look, look a weirdo with only a few chest hairs. Yeah, I think if you, it's like me, I'm, I'm at the point now, I'm like losing all my hair very fast. Um, hmm. I'm a bit, I'm not concerned about it, but I don't want to look like that guy who's got like f four hairs on his head and just keeps it, you know? I don't want to be like, what's, I don't know what the word is, you know, you just look ridiculous. I've been bold loads of times before. If you check out my Instagram, guys, I've got um, boldy pictures. So. Hmm. Genetics to determine hair patterns. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm destined to be bold. Definitely. I think Jerome's got a good head of hair. For now. We'll For see. Now. Until your little one um, grows up to be a mean teenager. That's not going to happen. She's going to stay nine years old forever. Forever. And, uh, forever. <laughs> I can wish. You, you know, I figure she's she's nine, so I probably have about twenty years before she starts dating. So that's twenty years to just get bigger and stronger and scarier and more intimidating. Or twenty might be a little naive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Cheers, guys. Now we're gonna um, round it up here. I hope that's been useful for you guys. Um, thank you for joining me for this impromptu, somewhat earlier than usual live stream of Carnival kind of Muscle Ramblings live Q&A 28 and thank you Jerome also for partaking in this delightful experience as usual. Thanks for having me on.